Hello and welcome to Books at HSS, a podcast by the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at LUMS in collaboration with Radio LUMS. For this podcast, we invite faculty at the HSS Department at LUMS to talk about their books. And today we have with us Dr. Asma Fez, Associate Professor of Political Science at LUMS and Director of the Political Science Program. And we will be talking about her book, In Search of Lost Glory, Sindhi Nationalism in Pakistan, which was published by Hearst in 2021. Welcome, Asma, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Noman. Thank you, Radio Lums team. Um, an author doesn't want anything else except to talk about their books. So thank <laughs> you for this opportunity. Excellent. Excellent. So but before we dive into the book, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how your project and this monograph came into being? Yes, thank you. So this is essentially like my first major academic love. And I have to um, tell you that I started out as an international relations person. And it was during my master's and IR is a very security centered field. And it was during my master's in the US that I realized that if you're thinking about Pakistan security, so actual issues are inside. So the conflicts are internal, not external, which took me towards the field of comparative politics. So I'm now a comparativist by training. This is what my PhD was in comparative politics slash political sociology. Um, I have been fascinated by Pakistan's ethnic fault lines. And why wouldn't a political scientist be? Because Pakistan's first major crisis, in some sense, was 1971, to the dismemberment of Pakistan, the state itself and the society. So this question about um, what is going on with Pakistan's ethnic minorities, why does every ethnic minority have a nationalist movement, this whole Punjabization of Pakistan, which is quite prevalent, not just in academic literature, but also like in everyday conversation, you hear political parties talk about it too. So all these questions fascinated me. And this is why in my PhD, which was done at Sciences Po in Paris, you know, I decided to focus on Pakistan's ethnic question. Now, for a number of reasons, we actually decided that I and the supervisor, we decided that we will work on Sindh. Mm. And one of the reasons for working on Sindhi nationalism was that, I mean, there is the other neighborly nationalist movement, which is the Muhajir nationalism, which has been in news also. And this has led to so much volatility and conflict too. Sindhi nationalism in some sense is low burner, low intensity, has been around forever, doesn't create that kind of violence. So now, today in 2023 and in the past also, we talk about Balochistan's ethnic insurgency as well. Militancy is going on. We don't have those peaks of militancy here, but it's a very long, sustained, a sort of a never-ending phenomenon. So it fascinated me. So I completed my PhD. I then wanted to, you know, convert it into a book form for which I updated it and one of the most I would say fruitful experiences enriching experiences was because as part of PhD um, you have to do field work which took me to Karachi, Hyderabad, Jamshoro. Now being an ethnic Punjabi myself and living through the within a certain bubble Islamabad, Lahore um, it is very interesting that you step out of that bubble and then you see how, in some sense, real Pakistan functions. So all of those grievances and issues and problems that you see on social media, that you see in newspapers, and then when you experience it, when you're out there in the street and then when people are pointing towards a thousand and one everyday problems. So in that way also, I... Personally, it was fascinating for me to visit Sindh multiple times, to engage with ethnic entrepreneurs, intelligentsia, political party walas from all sides, fundamentally. And that led to finally completion of this book. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'm going to pick up uh, 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 an idea that you introduced that that it's it's good to think of Sindh, Sindhi nationalism as a long sustained sort of slow burner of sorts. So, and in a sense, that's that's the broad framing that your that your book takes. Uh, you begin by putting things into perspective for us, and you talk about the emergence of Sindhi nationalism in in the context of colonial India. So, could we begin our conversation there? Could you tell us about the emergence of Sindhi nationalism? Uh, in, uh, in in the context of colonial India? Yeah. And here I would say that um, when I was searching for a title, so in search of lost glory, and politics is such an... It arouses so much emotions also that whichever side you were talking to, so if you were talking to the other, 
लाइक महाजन इंटेलिजेंसी और महाजन नेशनलिस्ट ड्यूरिंग माई फील्ड वर्क दैट्स वट आई एम रिफरिंग टू वट लॉस्ट ग्लोरी आर वी टॉकिंग अबाउट वेयर वॉज द ग्लोरी एंड आई मीन ऑफकोर्स वी हैव टू रिमेंबर एंड कंटेक्चुअलाइज सिंध सिंध इज़ होम टू इन दिस वैली सिविलाइजेशन मोहिंजो दड़ो सिंध वट एवर वी नो ए सिंध नाओ पोस्ट पार्टीशन इट हैड अ फेयरली ऑटोनमस एग्जिस्टेंस बिफोर एटीन फोर्टी थ्री सो एटीन फोर्टी थ्री इज़ अ टर्निंग पॉइंट बिकॉज चार्ल्स ने पियर लीड द ब्रिटिश फोर्सेज एंड सिंध यू नो फाइनली कम्स इज एनेक्सड बाई द ब्रिटिश एंड वॉट वी सी अगेन इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट बिकॉज हियर आई ऑल्सो वॉन्ट टू बाई द वे से दैट आई टॉक इन माई बुक अबाउट स्ट्रक्चर एंड एजेंसी दिस इज एन important debate in some sense across social sciences that uh, how do we explain a political phenomenon or social phenomenon is explanation better by dissecting the structure or is it through the agency of an actor what i found in my research was that i had to carry both of these things together because this st- by structure i mean state its structure its institutional design how it interacts with the local society and colonial state in that sense was very important because for instance in order for identity consciousness to emerge uh, you have uh, colonial government taking very important decision they are employing or deploying uh, the bureauc- um, uh, the british bureaucracy in sindh and they make it mandatory that they must learn sindhi language so local at at the official administrative level sindhi is introduced for the first time that leads to now this happens in 1850s by the time we come to the you know 50 years later we see what benedict anderson would call print capitalism so sindhi print capitalism 50 years of reading and writing in sindhi language it leads to publications of books and pamphlets there is an identity consciousness in emerging uh, in emergence at that time and that manifests itself because by first world war we see and afterwards we see there is a very clear demand that sindh which was part of bombay at the time so if you had to do a matriculation exam you would travel to bombay eventually uh, you um, there is a demand that sindh is distinct enough and strong enough and autonomous enough that it should be a separate province and we see historically the hindu muslim cleavage emerging because the hindu intelligentsia middle class was in favor of sindh continuing with bombay and of course uh, vice versa i mean for the uh, muslim intelligentsia and muslim um, uh, like you know p- uh, political parties and emerging parties they wanted sindh to be a separate province this gets done in, in you know 1937 this is a big step we see that sindh at the forf- is at the forefront of the pakistan struggle sindh assembly was the first assembly in history of pakistan now what is now pakistan which passed a resolution for supporting the creation of pakistan which makes it all the more interesting that what went wrong that so early after 1947 the same people who were at the forefront of the demand for creation of a muslim homeland you know they became so disillusioned and alienated that there was this expression of descent in the form of sindhi nationalism so that's why so we see emergence of parties proto parties leaders like gm sayed an iconic figure within sindhi nationalism this is all happening before 1947 and after 1947 the way post colonial state comes into effect and its policies that's where we see the major crystallization of this movement okay. thank you so much for that comprehensive picture so you talk about how um as far as the british colonial state was concerned one of the key things that uh, led to the emergence of a sindhi nationalist consciousness is is the formalization <laughs> of sindhi language is 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 the idea of the emergence of a distinct sindh uh distinct from bombay and and then in your book as you as you narrate this this particular journey of sindhi nationalism you talk of the partition of india as a as a cataclysmic event in fact you make the case that the partition of india introduces a three layered complexity at the heart of sindhi nationalism so could you draw for us yeah. what what some of the continuities are uh between pre partition and post partition uh sindhi nationalism and what are some new complexities that that get introduced by the the, the three that you discuss in the book yeah um i think that um in terms of and 
that three layered dimension of sindhi nationalism that fascinated me it came again from a canonical text written by paul brass who was studying ethnic conflict <coughs> in india and essentially uh, what's going on there is is that it's too simple to say it's just a sindhi versus a mohajer it's just ppp versus the mqm because you have this conflict which which is being played out at multiple levels and if we miss out you know that complexity we miss out some of the you know or our understanding falls short into understanding how a certain party is behaving in a certain manner so i'll just first quickly talk about the three layered conflict which is that number one we see very importantly that we have an intra ethnic contestation going on and which is i mean contextualized my in my book in the through the form of this never ending contestation between people's party which is the leading political party from sindh and the nationalist parties which are smaller now smaller in terms of their presence within sindh assembly or national assembly um smaller also in terms of um, in some sense you know presence in the street but at the same time they are very important but this sindhi nationalist parties like sindh united party or um, qaumi awami tehreek versus the people's party it's a very important conflict or, or contestation because it also shapes how the bigger party the people's party will position itself on certain key issues like should we have kalabag dam or not um the second layer of the conflict of course is since this home has been since nine, late 1970s home to two contesting nationalisms so sindhi nationalism was there from the first decade of partition after partition or creation of pakistan we have mohajir nationalism coming into full force in 1980s mqm all pakistan mohajir student organization followed by mqm and then you know the rest is history we all know how sindh has been even electoral space has been very neatly bifurcated you have uh, primarily sindhi votes going to the people's party and mohajir votes going to mqm at least this pattern was there in every election from 1988 to 2013 2018 was an exception and we get to see how it will play out in 2023 now so this contestation this conflict this bifurcation of sindh nationalist space is very important and the third one is um since quest for provincial autonomy in some sense this was the quest for autonomy so this is a historical continuity this was the quest for autonomy which led to demand that let's separate sindh from bombay and let's make karachi the capital and it should control its own affairs we see the same kind of struggle demand quest aspiration for autonomy even after 1947 and this has been a dilemma for all of the smaller units except punjab and even now punjab has produced an own ethnic movement which is this raiki movement in south and western districts of punjab so there is this constant demand that provinces ethnic communities have a right to govern themselves one of the interesting um revelations for me during the writing of this book was that we when we study pakistan studies uh, pakistani history uh, we were taught 1940 lahore resolution and there is a, only one particular context and paragraph of 1940 lahore resolution that we study but when i interviewed for instance um, ethnic leaders even in sindhi intelligentsia so they'll give a broader paragraph of 1940 lahore resolution and it very clearly mentions autonomous units that this was the promise that was made by the muslim league and by the founders of pakistan that once pakistan is created all of the territorial units will be given maximum autonomy that still hasn't been achieved so that's also for consider a kind of a betrayal and hence it fuels the nas- the nationalist anger that why hasn't been when something was promised to us in march 1940 so quest for provincial autonomy that lead that pitches these ethnic communities and sometimes provincial governments against a very overbearing center in the form of federal government sitting in islamabad so in terms of these uh, three layers if you could uh you, you make an argument in in the chapter that talks about this three layered complexity that uh one of the consequences of the partition was a major demographic shift yes. in in sindh and that sort of uh shapes uh, both contemporary politics and politics of the time could you talk a little bit about that demographic shift with us and um, yes because sindh under, underwent major demographic transformation and one of the losses for the um, essentially um, sindh was that sindh lost its middle class because the middle class was primarily hindu um, and they had to eventually leave 
and there is a, the only significant chunk of whatever that is left of Hindu population, it's still there in Sindh. And which is why we also see somewhat more plurality and tolerance in Sindh as compared to, for instance, where we are sitting in Punjab. Now, that middle class was lost and that was replaced by a new middle class or mid above, you know, in the form of Muhajir's arriving. Now, for me, again, you know, and because whenever we are going into research, we also, our own socialization that also goes in. There was significant movement of population which happened here in Punjab also. There was a massive transformation, Sikhs leaving and Muslims coming from Punjab. But it did not produce that kind of reaction, the kind of explosive reaction. So much so that the Sindhi nationalist movement is also described as a sons of the soil movement. Classical textbook sons of the soil movement that we are the sons of the soil. We are endangered by the arrival of these migrants and hence we must take action and hence we launch a movement and whatever the agenda but is. But such movements did not occur in the Punjab. Absolutely yeah. not. And that's such a and that was again something for me which was like a puzzle. And then um, I realized that because in case of Punjab in some sense you had deep familial, ethnic, linguistic sort of ties because the, after all it was Punjab province you, the line was cut across the Punjab province Vaga border etc so we still have Ferozpur Road and Ferozpur is on the other side of India there you have a completely different community which has had no historical memory or which also unfortunately did not even intermingle with the local population at least initially so when I was now you know writing this book and would meet Muhajir intelligentsia, they would say, but we are also Sindhis. But they didn't say this back in 1940s and 50s and 60s. They maintained that distance. So you have now Sindhi urban centers which have been taken up by uh, a community which has no roots here and which at that time, unfortunately, did not seem to show any interest in also like indigenizing itself. Now they do it. And the reason also is because you have more vi mi migrations of uh, population happening in Karachi. So I would look if you look at the census figures also, for instance, Sindhis and Pashtuns, they are major stakeholders, at least as far as Karachi is concerned. Back in the day, that is 1950s and 60s, we only have like Mohajir. So there was no intermingling. There was a dom loss of the uh, Sindhi middle class because Hindus had left. This new uh, middle class comes in. It's there. It's prevalent in urban centers. It's there in economy. It's there in local administration. So all of a sudden, a son of the soil has been living here for a lot of period of time is suddenly at the receiving end. And so much so that... Um, um, for example, young newspaper in 1950s and I would come across, you know, figures or uh, news items like the post office will not receive letters, you know, on the front of which uh, the address is written in Sindhi. So you can imagine the cultural backlash, the political backlash, because all of a sudden there was something which was, uh, and I talk about it in the book, a sort of a desynthization, a Sindhi language which was acceptable to the colonial state, but which wasn't acceptable to the post-colonial state. So, In fact, promulgated by the yes, colonial yes, state. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So that immediately the reaction to migration and migrant was expected in some sense. Right. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I want to move on to how your book pays sustained attention, not just to political parties, uh, political structures, but also some of the iconic figures of Sindhi nationalism. And you mentioned in the book that that's a deliberate methodological choice that you've made, that in talking about Sindhi nationalism, you're also, in a sense, narrating a story of sorts. So could you share snippets of your arguments about some of the iconic figures that you discuss yeah. with our audience? Yeah, so while there are many, um, many figures and personalities who have contributed to carrying, you know, this sort of emblem of Sindhi nationalism forward, but one cannot talk about Sindh and Sindhi nationalism without talking about GM Sayyid. And this again used to be uh, quite a very interesting puzzle for me as a political scientist. Because hardly a presence in elections, electoral arena, yet even in the second decade of 21st century, and my last fieldwork was done in 2019 and 20, I would go to uh, Sindh University Jamshoro, which used to be the hotbed of students' movement also. 
and see you know a students this generation of students talking about sai ji and sai ji's contributions such was his legacy and contribution because in, he was able to uh, m- um, not only mobilize but develop this message this narrative of sindhi nationalism this sense of persecution and alienation and deprivation which is at the heart of nationalist movement and nationalist politics and different parties presented in different ways but that is the original message and that was given by gm sayed and then of course um, there is also um, ibrahim joyo ibrahim joyo who only died few years ago i was able to um, lucky enough to attend there was a centenary 100th birthday of sai ibrahim joyo and i was doing my field work it was done at karachi arts council again significant contribution so many writings and those writings which i have been read and translated and continue to be read over you know chai ke stalls and you know sindhi um, cultural festival ayaz melo which is done every december i found so many books because i attended to ayaz melo festivals also uh, and then of course sheikh ayaz himself um in some sense culturally a larger than life figure huge contribution to poetry but also a symbol of resistance was at one point chancellor of sindh university vice chancellor of sindh university jamshoro also so while one talks about political parties like and the leaders like bhutto zulfikar ali bhutto benazir bhutto but these figures have shaped imagination aspiration of ordinary sindhis also so that sindhi nationalism that you see alive in the street it's also because of their contribution uh thank you thank you for that asma uh let's come to the people's party pakistan the ppp you dedicate a significant portion of your analysis uh, uh in the book to the ppp and one of the major scholarly interventions that you make in the book is that apart from thinking of the ppp as a major federal party it can also be productively thought of as an ethnic party and an ethnic entrepreneur so could you could you tell us what is an ethnic entrepreneur and how is this a uh, productive way to examine the history of the people's party pakistan and sindh yeah so thank you for this question it one of it's some about something which deeply fascinates me as an observer of politics now firstly i mean i want to mention ethnic entrepreneur um this is a terminology which i pick up from ethnic conflict literature which is in abundance because we have so much scholarly research on even on south asian cases like india sri lanka then we have africa where we have ethnic conflict going to horrendous extents like genocide in rwanda so kanchan chandra writing about india and others talked about ethnic entrepreneurs in very simple term we are talking about ethnic actors we are talking about ethnic nationalists we are talking about ethnic parties we are talking about people and parties and movements which carry a certain ethno nationalist agenda and um, so i borrow this terminology from this literature also now of course in my scheme of things i am studying gs in tehreek and which then fragments in 1990s and we have smaller parties emerging they are your um, conventional textbook ethnic entrepreneurs but there is a certain scholarly method to this madness also because we are also talking about uh, when we are looking at definition of an ethnic party so we are also looking at party positions over certain key issues agendas how are they positioning themselves let's say on water question or nfc award in all of them and when i try to measure party positions on those key issues people's party seem to have almost exactly the same positions that these nationalist parties have so as much as the nationalist parties would feel appalled in conversations that how can people's party be an ethno nationalist party how could it be conceived in that way it operates in rawalpindi and islamabad with because obviously there is a competition there so that's why you know they are being painted in that manner and similarly sometimes people's party folks or supporters supporting intelligentsia would also say but this is a party of federation etc but when you are using those scholarly criteria then you see that people's party has this fascinating dual role because it is a party of federation it has been in a favor of a strong healthy vibrant federation working in pakistan something that perhaps still hasn't materialized we're in 2023 it's also because sindh has produced you know a major party which has been in power in multiple times in islamabad so definitely 1972 
1977 but then martial law came 1988 benazir bhutto 1993 benazir bhutto then after her tragic assassination 2008 when asif zardari yusuf raza gilani so and otherwise we generally have mostly uh, punjab based parties which have been in power in federation so if you have a non punjab based major party which comes in power you know that adds to party politics also so it has to and it has always taken pro federation stances also uh-huh. so it is a pro federation people's party is a pro federation party and we can't forget that it was during the tenure of people's party 2008 to 2013 that we had the most landmark amendment being passed 18th amendment i call it a landmark amendment because this significant significantly altered the makeup of distrib- or the you know the whole setup of balance of power between center and provinces in terms of tra- transferring quite a few subjects into the provincial domain of jurisdiction has that been implemented have provinces actually become empowered or not that's a separate debate but this hadn't been done before so that's also this led to the first major grand ethnic bargain in some sense in pakistan because during the formalization and when this amendment was formalized it wasn't just the major parties like ppp and pmln it was also smaller ethnic parties who eventually then got together at the platform and you know formalized this but so on the one hand they there is that position that it has to take on the other hand it has the position that um it operates in sindh and one of the major reasons perhaps now in the last 10 15 years is that for the last two elections at least 2013 and 2018 we have seen people's party being confined to sindh it hasn't been able to win in punjab where it used to win in the past it hasn't been able to win in kp significantly we see whenever the next election happens they've been trying to reorganize and build themselves but if they are confined to sindh then they also have to take those positions they cannot for example ever take a position that let's build kalabagh dam so when they take those positions those are also very these are the similar postures and policy positions that nationalist parties advocate so in that way there is this dual role of the people's party hmm. thank you thank you for that and this also ties in with uh the the three complexities that you talked about that get introduced in the sindhi nationalism one being a sort of intra ethnic conflict between the ppp and smaller parties could you could you speak to the role of the ppp in in relation to that yeah and again i would also bring in a personal effect in it because when you're sitting in punjab observing politics you get a very different portrayal of people's party so um not necessarily always a positive portrayal you know, because we all follow public debate essentially this was very interesting for me to go and you know conduct field work and talk to ethnic entrepreneurs that how they view the role of people's party and of course this in academic terms it's classic ethnic outbidding they are trying to outbid each other and when they outbid each other they end up you know on a very at a very confrontational path sometimes taking very maximalist you know kind of a positions also and it's it's like a turf war going on between them and again one very interesting observation related to it is that this intra ethnic outbidding which was happening um led to the emergence of the demand for sindhu desh and in some sense the demand for sindhu desh gets really formalized in 1970 so the dream was there um gm sayed was active um on the sindhi horizon was continuously writing was mobilizing the public but the demand is formalized in 1970s not during a yub khan period not during zia ul haq period but when you had zulfikar ali bhutto was sindhi prime minister sitting in, in islamabad and it's also because uh, zulfikar ali bhutto's first tenure and perhaps the only tenure because then he was removed from power by zia ul haq he conducted some he took some policy decisions which in some sense responded to the agenda which was defined set up the demand set which was put out there by the nationalist party so for example sindhi language sindhi language finally leads to, uh, to a formalized status it is given a formalized status uh, by the people's party government um, and when when it also comes in power in sindh essentially so it becomes the official language and then it leads to the first major ethnic riots in sindh also so the poet rai samrohvi um, and the famous jung 
you know heading which i also then you know got from somebody gave it to me ke aaj uddu ka janaza nikal gaya like so much lamenting and mourning that what is happening now sindhi language is going to be the language of the province this was a major demand um, implemented by um, zulfikar ali bhutto government then also affirmative action quota system so there was a major significant gap between the um, the socio economic conditions of the muhajir community and the sindhi community i know one can also say that you know this is an overlapping state this is a very generalizable statement because you also have sindhi vadheras for example the feudal class being present but at the same time we see that there was a significant difference and how we see in other cases all across the world affirmative action is a thing it's meant to carry out or reduce asymmetry or inequality that exists between communities so quota action and a quota system and that led to a decline of muhajir representation in jobs then all pakistan muhajir student organization form is formed and then from there altaf hussain farooq satar they all emerge which then you know mqm is essentially formed so that period is very critical and some of the policy decisions of bhutto government are exactly what the nationalists were demanding so this leads to this major ethnic outbidding that continues and has continued but you said that it was it was fulfilling some of the demands yes but that leads to conflict yeah because then you're taking the agenda of the nationalist parties also this yes. is what they have been campaigning but they haven't been able to implement so they put the demand out there and then the people's party backed up by its weight backed up by its electoral you know success which it has had many so it then implements the agenda so in some sense you're depriving the nationalists of you know that appeal that they had and hence the bitterness in some sense also so that's fascinating right so the the the, the demands are being met yes. but the way they're being yeah. met sort of generates a a and contrary reaction and also not reaction. all demands right some not demands. all demands right. and also that if uh, any party which is you know from outside punjab when it comes into power in islamabad it will have to make compromises also compromise is the name of the game in politics also but as soon as the party will compromise you know make those compromises then of course but they are not pure sindhi enough they mm. are catering to punjabi lobby etc then those allegations uh, claims are made by nationalist parties versus people's party so it puts the people's party in a difficult position but it's also fascinating to observe it as a political scientist uh thank you thank you for that um I want to move on to another issue that your book thematizes which is the role of nationalist parties in since contemporary politics. Uh could you share what the contemporary political aspirations and possibilities of 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 such parties are? Yeah. So Sindhi nationalist parties are alive and kicking to some extent in contemporary politics also. One of the major shifts perhaps in nationalist movement was that after the demise of gm sayed there has been a fragmentation of the nationalist movement so what you see is that you have smaller parties multiple contenders for power from nationalist parties so like sindh united party which was also being headed by gm sayed grandson jalal mahmood shah you have uh, rasul baksh palijo and then his son ayaz latif palijo qaumi tehreek awami tehreek and qaumi awami tehreek you have dr qadir maksi um, sindh tarakki pasand party we also have these are the parties which are now in the electoral arena which agree with the supremacy of the 1973 constitution so agreeing with the rules of the game and carrying forward or contesting elections or doing politics in the street on the basis of demand for maximum provincial autonomy we also have other groups which are also described as militant groups like gsn um, jaskam jasmam com gsn qaumi mahaz gsn mutahhida mahaz who are more separatist in their orientation because they are no longer thinking in their view 1973 constitution federal republican framework is not good enough um, etc so we see that a we have this multiplicity of actors who are active on the political scene they haven't been able to make inroads into assemblies it's not like they're sweeping elections but at the same time just because they're not sweeping elections and winning majority in sindh assembly it doesn't mean that they're irrelevant so even 
um we have had another census just giving you an example in 2023 so one of the earliest complaints about mismanagement of election uh, of census undercounting of population it was the sindhi nationalist parties which tried to do a long march or street agitation etc so the point is that these parties act as a an agenda setter as a pressure group they are out there in the street they galvanize the population they you know sort of articulate those demands and if whoever is in power if it's people's party here usually it's people's party it's the third time that they have been in power or whoever else is there they cannot not afford to um, you know ignore that agenda so they have to respond to them it was very interesting for me to observe that there was this local government controversy that uh, people's party because it has tried to form alliance with mqm also at the national level as well as the provincial level and the local government question is a very thorny and a very difficult question because um, the demand and perhaps rightly so um, from karachi uh, mayors of karachi hyderabad and others is is that while center is giving power to provincial government now provincial power is also supposed to delegate power to the local government also that hasn't been happening and that hasn't been happening across the board in case of sindh it becomes even more complex because in case of karachi you will usually have mqm or the mohajirs winning those municipal elections local government elections also so there will be an ethnic dimension to that devolution of power fundamentally so in 2013 people's party brings out you know tries to codify a local government act all hell breaks loose the kind of attacks criticism mobilization that they face they immediately backtracked and withdrew that local government act and that was done to find a kind of a working formula with uh, mqm um, etc so again um, since united party awami tehreek etc might not have a lot of numbers but they certainly have that agenda setting power also and no party which is thinking of going back to the people can ignore that uh oh, thank you thank you for that asma so the last question i want to ask you is about the concept of everyday nationalism and uh in your, in your book you use it to ila- illuminate certain facets of sindhi nationalism could you could you speak to that yes and um thank you for asking me this question because we've talked about high politics um when competition at the highest levels party formation contestation and while i was on this journey of exploring sindhi nationalism first during phd and then in the finalization of this book i realized that nationalism is much more prevalent nationalist sentiment nationalist alienation a sense of persecution it's not just there when you're sitting in sindh assembly it's not just there when parties are negotiating with each other i would see this in hyderabad and jamshoro in an everyday setting also which took me towards some of the academic research also so for example terms like banal nationalism then roger brubaker has this fascinating study of this hungarian minority in a small romanian town and all he does is observes everyday nationalism nationalism and he calls it everyday nationalism so i learned from it and i tried to apply some of this metaphor as charles tilly famously said that sometimes how things happens happen tells you why they happen also so and i sort of like you know found resonance of it when i would be you know there in hyderabad and jamshoro so for example in hyderabad i you know i was lucky enough to find a place like cafe khana badosh which is a very now an important cultural space in some sense set up by these uh, wonderful uh, brave uh, sindhi women like amar sindhu and arfana mulla and they have a whole group of you know these women they work with women action forum many of the civil society initiatives also so this was a site for me because there were a lot of political discussions and conversations and events were happening this is where i as mela also happens every year and they are the organizers then i also went to jamshoro and sindh university jamshoro which has a historical presence uh, which has a historical significance in the evolution of sindhi nationalism also so those were my sites and in so many different ways for instance in terms of uh, street signs whether they are being written and it again i'll give you an example of hyderabad because there are two housing societies qasimabad and latifabad and much larger and then other housing societies also but latifabad 
پرائمیرلی مہاجر اسپیکنگ کمیونٹی اینڈ قاسم آباد پرائمیرلی سندھی اسپیکنگ کمیونٹی اینڈ اسینشلی ایون دا اسٹریٹ سائنس وڈ بی کمپلیٹلی ڈفرینٹ آئی وڈ سی اسٹریٹ سائنس ان اردو آل ریٹن وین آئی وڈ بی ان لطیف آباد قاسم آباد آل سندھی لینگویج اسٹریٹ سائنس سو یو ہیو نیشنلزم ایکسپریسنگ اٹ سیلف ان سو مینی ڈفرینٹ ویز ایون ان ٹرمز آف اسٹریٹ سائنس آلسو ایون ان ٹرمز آف یو نو واٹ وڈ بی دا کور آف کلاس سیون ٹیکسٹ بک سو دیر واز اے کانٹروورسی وے سن گورنمنٹ وانٹیڈ ٹو پٹ بے نظیر بھٹوز پکچر اینڈ دیر واز اے ری ایکشن فرام ادر کمیونٹیز آلسو سو ان دیٹ سینس ایوری ڈے نیشنلزم convinced me, um, alluded to me, explained to me that how critical, how important nationalism is. One doesn't have to be a card-carrying member of a nationalist party to adhere to this feeling. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, before we wrap it up, what, what's next for you? What are you working on next? Is, is, su- is, is some of the monograph going to bleed into future projects? Are you working on something completely different? Yeah. And um, thank you for asking me that also gives me some inspiration to th- think about future research, which I have been trying to do um, this. In some sense, there is a very clear continuity in my research, something that things that I have done after this, the publication of this book, because this came out in 2021 um, and some are new. So. Sindh has figured into my other academic interest, major academic interest, which is a study of post 18th Amendment federalism in Pakistan. Some of it is ongoing. And it was also very interesting because federalism was again a very contested arena from 2018 to 2022 because you had PTI in power in Islamabad and People's Party in power in Sindh. So because of the party competition. So that was one thing. Um, so federalism, study of federalism via focus. on synth and outside also that's one major important scholarly research i have been absolutely fascinated as a political scientist by ethnic parties also this is a long running love affair with the study of ethnic movements i am trying and hopefully um, if possible i would love to carry wo- this work forward to other ethnic parties also like ethnic parties of balochistan ethnic parties in south punjab um, that's again some of the, the this is the future project that i'm thinking about Do During these years, I, because since Pakistan has been passing through a wave of populism, so populism has interested me a lot and I have come out with some work and I would like to carry this forward and as a political scientist, I think it would be very interesting to capture this populist moment in Pakistan's history to make sense of it, how did it come about and whatever other que- affiliated questions also. So populism definitely is something that I'm planning to carry forward. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you.